Hey guys, I had the absolute pleasure to interview Joyce Meng, the INFJ, who has this incredible channel in which she brings people of different types together. And she also talks to each of them in depth to get a real good understanding, real understanding of all of them. And given all of this experience that she has, she is going to be sharing in this interview that I have with her insights that she has garnered on all uh, on many of the types and also um, her thoughts on intro intuition versus intro sensing on intro feeling dominant types on TE users such as ISTJs the NFJ NFP relationship dynamic and also the INFJ own sense of purpose and how it's it like to meet people of the same subtype and um, also about her life coaching as well and how she brings her INFJ insights into understanding you and letting you uh, realize yourself at a deeper level and I just want to let you know I if you want to learn how to provide empathetic detachment for yourself, how to combine empathy and a sense of mindful detachment. I have created a video on that and I'm going to put it right up here. And here is the interview that I have with her. Hey everybody, I have this really special guest here, Joyce, and she has a really amazing channel on typology, definitely worth checking it out. I really like how she's able to explain things really well on there. And I think when I look at her channel, I think about life. It's like, it's really lively because she brought so many people of different personality types onto this, her channel. And it's basically like a community over there. So welcome to my channel, Joyce. I'm glad to be on here. I feel the same way about your channel. It really teaches me about psychology and, and all things INFP. So thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious about your channel. So I know that with introverted intuition, um, introverted intuition likes to look at the development of things. So I was wondering with your channel, did you is this something that you visualize through your NI? Yeah, so I realized something missing from the type space was actual examples of people of the type. So what I wanted to add was like real people talking about their real experiences because hmm. it adds a three dimensional dimensionality to type and it lets you really see the reality of type and it lets people like get to know each other in the community too cuz I kind of see like two two problems in the community. One is the lack of examples in the second is people being in their own silos and they don't really talk to each other and they're kind of like so it's kind of like people will kind of attack each other from different sides it's very polarized like the tech community right now right. so my aim with this channel was to make make people less polarized <laughs> and yeah. so people could get along yeah yeah and then you've turned this ni vision into about an extra feeling community that it's about it is about bringing people together i think that's that is that is such a wonderful thing and uh i think it's also like really clever too <laughs> like it's easy to look online and look at a lot of theory but because you've brought a lot of concrete examples and together i think we could really look at how the different personality types work mm -hmm. It's like a network of friends. Right. It's like a network of friends. I like how that's put. So um, can you can you share about like the how your channel came about? Yes. So I always theorize about type. I, I feel like a, a vessel who's meant to like just ponder about abstract theory always. And so I, I really wanted to put myself out there. And so this channel was a way for me to overcome like my social anxiety and talk to people and also to get to intimately know people in this space. Like, so it's a genuine form of connection with others. And, and so what sprouted this desire was to, to 
get to know others more yeah. and to really like it, it's almost like a way to show the humanity of type so when you when you read a description it's kind of like it's cold but when you listen to a person talk about their story it's kind of beautiful so it's kind of like humans of New York. You have people telling you their, the, the stories of their life. I kind of want type talks to be that way. It's like humans of New York, but it's about type of typology as well. I, I, I love the idea. Um, and I think you are able to overcome a lot of challenges in order, in order to get there, like in order to realize this beautiful vision that you've, you've placed for and have everyone reap the, the riches of it that, um, you said you overcome your social anxiety along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of to break out of my shell and to talk about the thing I love most, typology and also people. So they combined is my dream paradise. So yes. yeah, every, everyone is kind of building to this vision of my, my dream paradise, which is of people really learning from each other and collaborating instead of, instead of being separate. Yeah. Wow. And um, I'm really glad that you're making this this happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be on here and to talk to wonderful INFPs like you. <laughs> so um, with um, this NI vision that you've created, so I, I, I really enjoyed listening to you. Your, your, your channel has re really uh, blossomed and bloomed. I see like a and you're also like very uh, productive too on it. Yeah, yeah. I, e each video brings a new realization. It's kind of trying to make learning fun. It's like trying to feed you broccoli, but that broccoli tastes good because you're weaving it in with other foods that taste good. That's the aim of the channel to make learning typology fun by adding the human touch. <laughs> yeah, all this like the best stuff happens when we're able to get past our fears and realize something that we really care about and we resonate. And I think you've created a really fun journey for a lot of people through, 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 through this channel. Um, and the funny thing is, um, so <laughs> I think uh, Joyce asked me to uh, give her some of these questions beforehand, right? So I just, I just like uh, threw out random questions from my expert intuition and I didn't even remember what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are these questions that I have? But um, so um, I have them here. So I'm curious about your insights. So now that you've seen so many people on this channel and just like very real experience that like you've, you've met people, got to know them at a very human level, not just at, at a theor theoretical level. I was kind of, kind of curious what kind of insights that you have gotten along the way. I know that might be a broad question too. Yeah. I realized that when people explain their own cognitive functions, they're able to go deeper than you know, the surface level happy descriptions of the MBTI because the MBTI is critiqued as being like the happy type of indicator where it only tells you good traits about you. I feel like when you ask people about their real life experience, they're able to describe it in much more depth and detail and even describe the not so pretty parts as well. And so what you'll learn from listening to people talk about themselves is the whys behind the behaviors. So what makes type type is you're really trying to figure out what a person's why is, why they do something, not just beyond the surface of their behavior. And when you have real people explaining to you the whys of what they do, you, you really get to understand the essence of type at its core. Yeah. Yes, that, that, that's wonderful. I think that's like the INFJ dream to get at the why. Mm. And it's, um, I, I think that yielded some really fascinating uh, results. And I've uh, listened to parts of your interview piece. I've listened to them all, to, all today. And um, it was really fascinating. You get like, uh, there's these series that Joyce has done on each of the cognitive functions and really goes in depth with each person, to every, everyone talking about their own personal experience. And it's definitely quite a reward. So for, it's really rewarding for me because um, there's something about learning about types 
uh, just like what's what's online versus what's uh, what's is someone's personal experience with the function. Yeah, and it also allows you to root out misconceptions as well, because mm -hmm. it's giving a type their time in, in court and allowing them to speak on their behalf. So it, it's not like an INTJ writing about an ESFP. It's an ESFP actually talking about their experience as an ESFP, which is it does them way more justice than someone else who's not them talking about their type. Because they kind of see it like this. When we try to write about people who aren't us, it's kind of like when two couples fight and they're trying to interpret the other side. They're like, you did this because of that. And I know for sure that that was the reason why you did that. And then the other couple's like, that is not why I did that. But you can't really like communicate it to them because the other party's already made up their mind. And so what I feel like type talks helps people with is like it gives people the chance to really explain their side instead of us always assuming how their brain is like that it gives them justice to their side and it allows the other side, the other couple to to tell their truth instead of having someone put words in their mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're hearing really directly from the person about what their experience is, uh, giving them justice. And um, I, th I think that that's something that I could really appreciate that you, you do. You, you're really coming from this standpoint of fairness and also fr from a standpoint of wanting to provide depth to this uh, community. Yeah, yeah. If if nothing, depth is my goal. <laughs> yeah, and I I love depth psychology, and really getting Me too. to yeah, <laughs> getting to the bottom of people's humanity. Yeah, and I feel like the best way to get to the bottom of someone's humanity is to hear from the source mm -hmm. instead of playing broken telephone with other people trying to figure out what someone is thinking through another person. You you get to hear from the source. <laughs> and what's something that you 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 found that you've learned that was really inspiring to you or uh, and a realization that you've had about a type or about a function that you found well that that is something interesting yeah so I've, in this community, I've come across some INFJs who are exactly like me. Like there are some people in your type that you'll kind of relate to. Like, you know that you share the cognitive functions, but there's an average level of relating to it. Um, and then there are some people who are just you, like they're you incarnate. And I've met some carbon copies of me and it has been kind of unsettling in, in the best way possible because it reinforces to me how real type is because like there are subtypes within types but when you reach that subtype of like INFP or INFJ that is you it feels like you are home it feels like you've you've landed home you're an alien who who found their home <laughs> how is it like for you to talk with somebody else who is your subtype of type of INFJ yeah, it makes you feel less crazy for thinking the way that you think. And so some of the things that we talked about were, you know, introverted intuition. And I, it really cares about future implications and sustainability. Like a word often associated with NI is knowing. And I think what NI knows is that like how things repeat in cycles, like the nature of knowing things happen in cycles. There, there's a cyclical nature to things. And hearing someone with like this slick, cyclical awareness of like the cause and effect of the end result of things, like the final state of reality and hearing them voice it in, in their own words, but it kind of felt like they were me, but a man <laughs> it's almost so it's so weird it's uncanny mm. and it's um, it feels less alienating you feel seen understood valued in that you're you you have a purpose in the world because you can see that they have a purpose in the world so then you can then see your own purpose through that it's like vicarious purpose through you i can see that i matter in the world because i know that you matter and you're like me so then i must matter right yeah so it's quite beautiful like that yeah, so, you, you know that you, you, you know you have your place in the ecosystem of the world. Yeah. Wow. So you see how every type has their place, but not only every type, but also each of the subtypes. And you could see and you could witness how they operate and how it's uh, useful and it really contributes something to, to others. And, and you see, well, I, I could 
I could also see that in myself too, and it's a very validating experience. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Yeah. It, it kind of feels like you, you have a language to what you already know. There's this quote that I really like, and it's like, find people who speak your language so you don't have to spend the rest of your lifetime translating your soul. And a lot, like, for, for me, I kind of feel like a backwards child. You know, in my family, I've always been a backwards child, as in, like, I, I, I came out of the womb, the womb, like, thinking about insights about people and humanity and human nature. And, like, no other kid is like this, or, like, a few other kids are like this. But I always felt a little different, like an old soul in a, in, in a vessel, in, in, a, in a being that was meant to, like, just uncover insight and how things unfold over time and it's quite interesting to 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 know that i'm not alone in, in that experience that you know type makes you feel like you're not alone as a person because these there are these archetypical patterns there are these thematic outlines that we generally fall into and that someone can relate <laughs> yes. so it's, it's kind of like a Carl Jung incarnate. <laughs> this is kind of like what what he has been doing. He's able to see what the the basic archetypes are, and you this is what you pick up on pretty easily. And mm -hmm. then I, I I really love the metaphor that you had about um, in one of your interviews. We talked about the hier the hierarchy of needs and of Maslow, and for the INFJ that would be something that's intuitive rather than something that is about security or safety. Yeah, we're like the Maslow hierarchy of needs, but backwards. So we have self-actualization as the first need and every other need is supporting that need. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. Can, can you explain that further? Yeah, it's almost like our, our purpose as a person is to figure out what human life means, why we exist on earth and what what we really contribute and why and like basically you're looking at everything and you're going like what does this mean you know you look at anything you're like what is the deeper meaning behind this and your brain never lets you off the hook and so you're stuck always in this state of wanting to self-actualize and reflecting over the the grander relationship of reality and you're stuck there you're you're almost forced to think about those things well, it's like you could see what your your role is here mm -hmm. with yeah. it, and um, yeah, and it could almost like um, for 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 everyone, it could feel like we're stuck in in our first function in a way that this is basically colors our whole entire life and what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all encompassing. It's almost like the water we are in. If we if we were fish, it is our water. It is our everything and we don't even know how much we're in it. And it's almost like our eyes, you know, it's the thing which we see everything through, but we cannot see our own eyes. Right. Yeah, so it's our, our lens, our eternal lens for everything we see everything through. Yeah, it is our way of uh, being able to look at the world from, from yes. our own, own perspectives. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious because I, I see that you do have a lot of insight so I was wondering, like, what are some of the insights you have about typology in general, in terms of the, the purpose of it, if that's the word? Yeah. So I see typology, its purpose is it, it's a base truth in, in order to find further truths. So, you know, like the structure and the outline of someone and through that, you can inquire on their own individual way of becoming that type and their unique journey, but it all leads back to this broad generalization of their type. So you kind of, through a, through this, like type is kind of an icebreaker to, to find the deeper things about people. Because if you know the generalities of someone, then you can then go to, okay, so what make up these generalities for this person? And you it's like the gateway to deeper conversation and it's also very, it has a lot of truth to it. You kind of feel like life isn't this random chaotic mess, but there is some, there's some line keeping everything together. And so that's what type is there. It, it adds structure to the chaos. 
That, that's really interesting that um, it could seem things are random day to day, but there's an underlying structure behind it. And this is something that Carl Jung d does write about that there's this, um, in general, even outside typology, there's an underlying structure and, and PC is probably like an NI type. <laughs> you, you could probably predict what's gonna, gonna happen based on your understanding of what the structure is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, NI and SI, they're, they're known as, they kind of relate everything back to a pre-existing structure, whereas NI relates things back to stored generalities, while SI relates things back to stored particularities, so very specific things. And, and so what type gives me is like this general framework in order to make sense of, of bigger things about people. It's, it's almost like it gives me a... A platform to then center my my mind on, um, like so. Basically, it, I, I like to look for the ripple effects of things, and so type is like that first ripple in which I can search for more ripples. Uh, like what else it causes off of that too. So yeah. Oh, so what are you finding? What am I finding? Mm -hmm. So I find that particular types. They'll, they'll say certain words over and over again. Um, and, and what they signify is like this core cognition that they have. For, for instance, with, with FI, <laughs> I noticed that there's a very like personal attachment to the things that they create. So sometimes they see things that they create as a part of them or, and they're able to add this human signature to the things that they create, like this individualistic signature that is very beautiful. Yes, my, and, my, my lamp is alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you guys add personality, flair, and a humanness to the things that you write and do. And there's this, in with FI DOMS, there's this level of self-examination that you see that is unparalleled. And it's beautiful because it gets you to reflect on parts of your human nature that you've been neglecting until you've read the F.I. Dom's work. And then you're like, wow, I feel more human after reading this because they were able to articulate a part of the, of the human experience in a way that I haven't been examining as much. So they almost give you a further level of self-awareness through their own self-awareness. Uh, so that's something I see with F.I. Dom's. Yeah, so even though it's like very subjective, um, yeah. remember what Carl Jung wrote about, uh, essentially because people's inner makeup is similar in many degrees, in many ways that um, by the intro feeling type being able to communicate themselves, um, then people could actually resonate with that experience. Yeah, yeah. It's like a masterpiece of self-reflection that I see FI Doms make. Like even with your writing, Leon, it's very touching because you you will ruminate about very, very impactful and humanistic topics. Like you'll talk about then how to, to cope with endings and how to deal with difficult emotions and how that's really like from your perspective. And then it creates this dynamic, this dynamic writing piece. You know, with your writing, you kind of leave your your ha your fingerprint on it. Like when I read your writing, I know it's Leon's piece of writing. And I feel like FI is kind of like that. When you read a piece of writing by an FI user, you can feel their fingerprint on it. <laughs> Interesting. And how about like when you read things from other types, what, what kind of um, sense do you get from that? What they write? Yeah, with... With TE users, so I'm setting up an INTJ panel right now, and what's happening is like the INTJs are sending me very formal, formal pieces of writing. They're like, "Hello, Joyce. To prepare for this panel, should I do this or this?" And I've, I've like, man, this is one of the most formal pattern, most formal pat panels I've ever done because I'm getting these emails and these Twitter, um, these Twitter kind of private messages by the INTJs that I'm going to interview, and they're so formal because like, like the te kind of adds this like formality to their writing i don't know maybe itjs when they communicate it's a it's like it add, they add this level of te formality and i'm like i'm your friend just you know <laughs> be casual <laughs> interesting. it's interesting 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm curious to know about more like, what would you say would be like an NI pattern, for instance? That's true. Oh yeah, to add to that previous point, I realized that the reason why TE users write like that is because they're trying to respect authority. Because there's this, this part of TE that naturally acknowledges that authority exists. And, 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 and so that's why when they write, it can be kind of formal. Oh, that's why, all right, okay. Um, so with NI patterns that I've been noticing, NI can often feel like a source of when it's paired with TI, nonverbal knowing. And I know that ESTBs describe it like that and, and INFJs do too. It's almost like you, you, you can articulate it when people ask you, but wh where it starts out is almost like this nonverbal knowing. And, and so the NI patterns that I've seen throughout the patterns is that you, you'll see people's type through the meta, the meta behaviors that they have throughout the panels. Like for the INFP panel we had together, Leon, <laughs> the INFPs, whenever you mention a topic where they're passionate about, they, they will go all out and, and then they'll start going like, yes, yes, no, no. And then they'll start passionately debating each other. Yeah. So I noticed that with, with FI, it tends to result in very passionate opinions. Mm -hmm. Even with the, the ITJs I have on my panel with tertiary FI, they are so passionate, but they hold it back because they have like a level of profession. <laughs> this is no shade, but it's like, they told me that they hold it back for like me. So it's almost like this measured passion in that when FI is in the third slot, but when it's in the first slot, you, they just go straight out war with each other on the panel. So that was very interesting to, to hear all the passionate FI opinions go back and forth. And it, it's interesting to hear that, like, with FI, it's easy for, for them to voice maybe the less personal opinions. But when it comes to, like, the truly personal opinions, they may never really say it because that's a vulnerable part of them. So it, it's really interesting how the most personal part of people that you won't really hear. So the, the actually, like, the, the part that tells you the most about them people might keep to themselves. And it kind of says something about people in general and that to kind of assume that everyone has this invisible side to them that they're not showing to anyone else because the more personal something gets, the harder it gets to articulate because the more is put at risk when you put that out. And so people often keep the most precious sides of themselves to themselves, which ironically can be kind of lonely because you're always keeping this most precious part of yourself to yourself because you, you want to defend it and protect it from a world that could possibly shoot it down and hurt it. Mm -hmm. But what that also does is it prevents con connection because if you're never really voicing the things that, you know, really make up you, then people aren't getting to know you on the deepest level that they could. And so it, it's, it's kind of ironic. All people want and they desire is true intimacy, but because they're so afraid of getting hurt, they act in ways that are against that goal and they prevent themselves from reaching and obtaining that truest form of intimacy. Yeah, it's almost like it's a form of self-sabotage because we care about that part of ourselves so much that we don't really show it and give it a chance for it to shine. Yes, I, I would say so. Um, so since I, I do psychotherapy work, I, I do see that Despite typology, um, there is similarity in people's makeup, and one of them yeah. is a universal need for uh, connection. And and whether people have that or not, it's it is separate from type. So there there are like you could even have extra feeling dominants who have a a style of uh, attachment which is kind of uh, avoidant or dismissive in a way. But they but then they'll express it from so differently from someone who's an INTP who has that same style of, of, of relating. Yeah. Leon, I think I might be an avoidant attachment style myself and how that manifests in me is I kind of have a hard time feeling close to people unless I know the concept of them, unless I know like the theoretical makeup of them and ask them like questions that get to like their their core nature. I don't feel close to them. Like it doesn't matter how many meals they feed to me. Like it kind of makes me feel like cattle almost. So a lot of relationships make me feel like cattle on a slaughter farm. So mm -hmm. it's almost like 
you know, they'll feed you food and they'll consider that love, right? And then I'll be like, this feels like abuse because it kind of feels like mm. all they're doing is taking care of my physical needs and not taking care of my metaphysical needs, which is right. feels more real to me than my actual physical needs. <laughs> And so I constantly, I constantly feel deprived and kind of dehumanized as like a form of, of cattle to be fed for slaughter because no one really cares about my intellectual needs. Mm -hmm. And so I think like intuitives, they really have, they, they need like a abstract nutrition. They need abstract conversation as much as they need nutrition for their bodies. Right. And I realized that it, it, it kind of causes me, like it gives me this form of detachment from people because unless they really, like I connect with them on that level, it feels like we're strangers and I can't help it, but it's true. And I've realized that about myself. And I think that's why some NFJs can identify with being avoidant attachment because they feel like not genuinely connected to people. They may crave it, but they may realize that it's lacking. Like the most important element is, is not there. Like, you know, when you make a, a cake and you're leaving out the thing that makes it a cake and then it's just, I don't know, pudding at that point. So it kind of feels like that. It feels like most relationships feel like a subpar cooking recipe. And you're you're always looking for that perfect, you know, five-star sushi, but you're always getting supermarket sushi. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like supermarket sushi, but what I would love is five-star sushi, which is always like, it's so hard to find that. And so I often find that relationships can be kind of one-sided where, you know, I really understand the other person and I make them feel very seen and heard, but no one really gets gets me. And so it's it's almost like I try so hard to understand a person's abstract makeup that I'm able to really get at it. Like that's what makes them tick, that that is their core nature and I'll get it. And they'll feel so understood, but it feels like no one can really do the same back. And it feels kind of lonely, but it's, it's okay. You know, it's like a familiar loneliness. Yeah. Of being an intuitive. <laughs> I yeah. think it applies for all. Uh, yeah, understandably. So it's like um, um, you, you, you really have that sense of an, an awareness of what you uh, need, right? And, how, and also how you work too. And you mm -hmm. find that um, in, that intuitive side is really important for that sense of connection. Mm -hmm. right? and, and you could be, um, and of course, I'll, could be feel very alien and alienating the world to to not get that from a lot of people for sure yeah absolutely but i do get it through like my my nf friends that i have mm -hmm. all of my friends are fi users all of them like i have one enfj friend and that's it but the rest are fi throughout the entire life that i've had so i have this weird thing where i i can kind of speak in, in NFP language because they're all my friends and I've had to learn the hard way <laughs> to do it. <laughs> but it's like, they, they're they also able to, to, like we're able to keep up with each other's abstractions. So with most people, I feel like when I talk abstract, the most they can do is listen and kind of understand it. But I find with NFPs or even NFJs as well, it, we're able to add to each other's abstraction. So we build on each other's abstraction and we really are able to come to a, a larger, broader abstraction from there. If it, it feels like like true, true, true friends, <laughs> I don't know. It feels yeah. like what I've always searched for, you know, in those friends. Yeah, I, 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 would, I, I would agree. So like when I, talk with my um, NFJ friends. It's like as the um, conversation is faster piece, we have in some ways a similar kind of cognition style, even with different cognitive functions. And mm -hmm. so the translation is very rapid and mm -hmm. so we could reach, um, we could reach a conclusion together <laughs> when I'm talking to somebody else is, um, they don't quite get. So like when I talk with an NT, like there's that similar level of N, but I think, um, I think this goes both ways too, but like there's a bit of the undervaluation of the, the feeling component and how that is actually is good at investigating things and phenomenon. But for them, it's like, oh, that's kind of like a subpar way to investigate matter. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I, I find the NFP and NFJ dynamic is pretty great because it's like the NFPs are the conceptual starters. They'll bring up all these cool new ideas and brainstorm. And the NFJs are conceptual finishers. And so they take the NFP's idea and they finish it, you know? And so that's a beautiful relationship where the NFP is like the sprinter. It'll take an idea and sprint with it for a while. But the NFJ is like the marathoner. It'll take that idea and take it to its end to its completion. And so it's a beautiful pairing there, but we tend to like NFPs and NFJs also rub each other the wrong way sometimes too, because of the FI and the FE. Right. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I really hate long distance running. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm like a sprinter in every sense of the term. So like, besides like where it comes to like, um, like literally sprinting, <laughs> sprinting. That's why I like bike being on a bike because then I could just like roll. With, with the wheels yeah my middle name is patience because i'm okay with going the full way with an idea yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great great um i'm curious um i'm trying to remember my questions again <laughs> let me see what i have um so um you you've Tell me about some insights about INFJs and also like um, thoughts about other types. And you do life coaching yourself, right? And I, I could see mm -hmm. your, you, you being a really good coach because um, of your really insightful and articulate nature. And I think people could really appreciate being understood by you. Can yeah. You, can you tell me a bit more about your work? Yes, so I love life coaching. My my dream goal is to be a life coach full time. And for the people who help me do that, like, thank you so much. But it, it's almost like it is it is a dream because I get to really talk to people and figure out like like their themselves as as people apart from their job, apart from their their titles, apart from some sort of surface appearance. Like I really get to realize like the bottom like the, the bottom line of who people are and it's very rewarding <laughs> you, you it's beautiful because i kind of help people understand themselves more on a on and like help them figure out the humanity that lies beyond their surface so it's kind of like a russian doll so it's like i i take a russian doll and i take out a layer and then there's a smaller russian doll and then you take out that russian doll and there's a smaller russian doll and then there's an and under that is, is an even smaller russian doll so i kind of help people kind of uncover those layers of russian doll that they have that they haven't been looking at and you know life coaching has been like slowly but surely turning into like a helping people resolve their underlying trauma so what happens is like people kind of go to me when therapy hasn't been working and so i'm like their alternative therapy solution that's what where it's been going yeah and i find that when when people genuinely share about their lives and they tell me about like the reality of their lives it makes it even easier to connect them back to type because people think that you know to get to the core of type you have to keep discussing type and what i would say to that is you actually have to get people to d discuss their experiences in a raw way and and from that they'll they'll explain things that they wouldn't have otherwise said right. and then you'll you'll be able to link that to type in an even deeper and more gratifying way that's and true. so yeah that's what coaching helps me do it helps me get people to genuinely share parts of themselves that they haven't for years and it's for me to pay rent yeah so it's lovely <laughs> <laughs> help joyce pay rent <laughs> <laughs> yeah i definitely find that to be the case um, um for, for instance if you start off a, a session with uh like id therapy like um, what's the what's a problem to address, right? It's it's hard for them to actually address what their actual problem is because they're trying to really consciously focus on on the issue, but it, it is important to just let them talk and, and relax and that really lets the unconscious out. Yeah, it's like the first problem that people state that is their problem is never really their actual problem. You always have to look deeper than what the person thinks their issue is and you'll find out that it's rooted way, way, further than that. Wonderful. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, Joyce, it's great to have you on my show. It was, it's great being on as well. 